This is Ecotherapy Research since 2018, Part 2, for Ecotherapy and Introduction. The next topic or study we're going to look at is Johnson 2021 Eco Art Therapy. The study this comes from is Adrian Johnson 2021 Pathworking Mixed Methods Study of Eco Art Therapy and Mindfulness in Women with Eating Disorders. First off, about the study. This research study investigated the effect of the eco art therapy intervention pathworking on the experience of mindfulness of women with eating disorders. We'll be talking more about pathworking later on in the ecotherapy interventions section, but for now, let's just say that it's an eco art therapy intervention. The experience of mindfulness was examined using a convergent mixed methods design. Six participants engaged in two 90-minute group art therapy sessions. Each session began with a mindfulness meditation. And again, this is the Mindful Ecotherapy Center that you're taking this course with. So, ecotherapy and mindfulness work well together. And if you're taking an ecotherapy course, you should probably be at least basically familiar with the tools of mindfulness. In the first session, the participants created art on river rocks based on their current emotional experience. In the second session, participants engaged in a group sculptural process to create a path with their art rocks. Participants completed the Freiburg Mindfulness Inventory Measurement at the beginning of the first session and the end of the second session. Although the study's results were statistically significant, they are not generalizable for populations outside of those with diagnosed eating disorders. In addition to the statistical analysis, a thematic analysis was conducted to identify four main themes based on the participants' verbal discussion during processing and their artwork. Pathworking is an eco-art therapy intervention in which the participants create art using smooth river rocks as a substrate and acrylic paint, brushes, and paint markers as the medium. After the participants complete their art, participants construct a walking path with their rocks. When the path is constructed, the participants observe the shape of the path, the artwork created on rocks, and their experience of being outdoors. Pathworking may help address mindfulness and the application of a nature experience in art therapy. The results indicate that pathworking may provide an effective intervention for women in eating disorder treatment to increase their experience of mindfulness. Although the results indicated a positive change in their mindfulness experience, it may take a further study of this population to increase the depth of mindfulness experience long term. Also, when we were discussing pathworking, this particular study did one iteration of pathworking. It's an eco art therapy technique that has many applications, and we'll talk about some more of those when we get to the videos on eco therapy interventions. Problem statements for this particular study Women with eating disorders may struggle with lower experiences of mindfulness, which is potentially detrimental to their recovery process. There's very little research regarding eco-art therapy and its effect on the experience of mindfulness. Due to the detrimental nature of eating disorders on a person's psychological and physiological well-being, holistic treatment including evidence-based and expressive arts-based methods must be incorporated to address the core issues and provide an avenue for healing. Here are the research questions used in this study. This mixed methods study was guided by the following questions. One, how effective is the Pathworking Group Eco Art Therapy Directive at increasing the experience of mindfulness in adult women with eating disorders? Two, what themes of mindfulness are experienced in group eco-art therapy? Here are the basic assumptions of this study. That time spent creating art outdoors can encourage mindfulness of one's experience of the present moment. 
for those suffering from eating disorders, being aware and fully present in the current moment can offer benefits for healing and recovery. Moving a therapy session from an indoor environment to an outdoors setting may heighten the experience of mindful self-awareness for the participants in the study. This heightened state of mindfulness may become a learned trait that can be used in life situations outside of group art therapy. Statement of Purpose for the Study The results of this study could be used to develop eco-art therapy directives and experiences for adult women with eating disorders to increase mindfulness. This study may support the use of eco-art therapy in positively impacting the development of mindfulness skills through the experience of mindfulness in nature for individuals with eating disorders. Definition of terms used in the study. Art therapy is an integrative mental health and human services profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through active art making, creative process, applied psychological theory, and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. Eating disorders are disturbance in eating and related behaviors which impact nutrition negatively and can result in severe physiological and psychological health issues. Eco-art therapy uses natural materials to create works of art for the purpose of connecting with nature and recognizing that each person plays a role in the ecology of life. And that definition is from Snyder, 2018. Eco-psychology is a field that explores how the human emotional connection with the natural environment creates its own ecological system and what the ethical duty of humans is to the earth. Ecotherapy is rooted in eco-psychology and espouses that humans are intrinsically connected to nature and are nurtured by a positive relationship with the earth. And again, those definitions are Snyder, 2018. Ecotherapy is intended to engage the body, mind, and soul by emphasizing one's entire ecosystem. Mindfulness is defined as the practice of maintaining a non-judgmental state of heightened or complete awareness of one's thoughts, emotions, or experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. This includes an openness to the current moment's experience, focused attention, and the ability to reflect upon one's thoughts. Pathworking is a nature-based art therapy intervention that utilizes art making on natural river rocks, group dynamics of installing art on a path, and mindful walking. Self-awareness is defined as the ability to focus on oneself as an object and to use this information as a motivation for action. The information that motivates the action comes exclusively from cognitions or metacognitions. To summarize, individuals diagnosed with clinical eating disorders are often in life-threatening medical and psychological conditions. Group therapies can aid eating disordered clients in exploring their interpersonal skills and understanding that they are not alone during treatment. Nature-based or eco-art therapy can be used in various scenarios to gain a different perspective in treatment. Spending time in nature may also help foster a shift in mindfulness, bringing about a greater sense of awareness. The literature on mindfulness and eating disordered behaviors asserts that lower levels of mindfulness experience are present in individuals suffering from significant disordered eating behaviors. The results of the study. The researcher utilized quantitative and qualitative data to measure the effectiveness of the eco-art therapy intervention path working in women with eating disorder diagnoses. The path working intervention results indicated that there was a statistical evidence that the intervention is successful within the researcher's chosen format. 
Further areas of research are identified with broader populations within this demographic. Results of this study included qualitative and quantitative data measuring the level of mindfulness experienced in six female participants experiencing eating disorders. Major themes were identified that coincided with the researchers' anticipated findings. The Freiburg Mindfulness Inventory scores were evaluated by the researcher to ascertain the effectiveness of the pathworking intervention with this population. Results indicated four main themes constructed from the data based on qualitative data and eco-art therapy artwork. One was an increase in self-awareness and mindfulness. Two was experience of emotional awareness. Three was acknowledgement of nature's role in mindfulness. And four was control and restriction of the art process. So in short, the study demonstrated that this particular eco-art therapy intervention using pathworking could increase mindfulness in people who have been diagnosed with an eating disorder. The next study is Baden and Jackins, 2021, Scoping Review of Interventions for the Treatment of Eco-Anxiety. Ecotherapy originally came about because people had begun to develop anxiety based on what we were doing to the environment. One of the landmark books called Silent Spring by Rachel Carlson, which I believe came out in 1962, was about DDT, an insecticide or pesticide that was damaging the environment and then later was found out to cause cancer in humans. And her whole book was the beginning of that eco-awareness movement. And as time progresses and as fewer and fewer things are done about ecological crises like the mass extinction that we're currently in, climate change, those sorts of things, people develop more and more eco-anxiety. So this particular review, a meta-study, is going back and looking at the original intention of ecotherapy to treat the anxiety caused by living in a planet that we're consciously attempting to destroy. So let's look at the introduction of this study. As climate change worsens and public awareness of its grave impact increases, individuals are increasingly experiencing distressing mental health symptoms, which are often grouped under the umbrella term of eco-anxiety. Clear guidance is needed to enable mental health professionals to make informed choices of appropriate interventions and approaches in their eco-anxiety treatment plans. A scoping review was conducted to examine the current understanding of eco-anxiety and related intervention options and recommendations. The review included 34 records, 13 of which reflected specific psychological approaches. A thematic analysis of the content of the selected records yielded five major themes across interventions for individual and group treatment of eco-anxiety. First, practitioners' inner work and education. Two was fostering clients' inner resilience. Three, encouraging clients to take action. Four, helping clients find social connection and emotional support by joining groups. Five, connecting clients with nature. And then finally, recommendations for treatment plans are to focus on holistic, multi-pronged, and grief-informed approaches that include eco-anxiety and focused group work. The study defines the impact of climate change as the unfamiliar, human-induced changes in atmosphere and depletion in biodiversity and other natural systems. Public awareness of the effects of climate change is rising due to growing media coverage and the release of alarming reports and warnings by major organizations like the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Research confirms that our collective sense of a looming climate change-related threat is taking a significant toll on our mental health. 
One of the things that I found interesting in my own practice and my own research is that even people who publicly espouse conspiracy theories like st stating that climate change is a hoax, those, those sorts of things, in private actually believe about, believe in and are concerned about climate change. So there's a disconnect between the public personas that some people put on and what they privately experience and privately believe. So they have an, an added layer when facing treatment of having the dichotomy of espousing one thing in public and believing another thing in private. The term eco-anxiety is used to describe the emotional and mental states associated with heightened awareness of climate change and concurrent distress in the face of its threatening implications for the future. Individuals who suffer from eco-anxiety experience a constellation of emotions including fear, anger, exhaustion, powerlessness, feelings of loss, helplessness, and even phobia and despair. The need for informed professionals is more pressing than ever, as the prevalence of eco-anxiety and demand for its treatment are on the incline. Many mental health professionals have called for an increase in awareness of and training for eco-anxiety. Now let's turn to the study. The methodology was that the main research question is, what is known from the existing published literature about interventions for the individual and group treatment of eco-anxiety? The secondary research questions are, what published literature is available from different psychological approaches and perspectives on interventions for the treatment of eco-anxiety? How do different psychological approaches differ or concur on the interventions they propose for the treatment of eco-anxiety? What published literature exists proving the efficacy of any of these interventions? The methods. The scoping review method aims to map key concepts, sources, and types of evidence that underpin a research area. Approximately a thousand records and studies on eco-anxiety were researched for this study. Upon review, 34 were selected for the purposes of the study. The interventions identified in these records were clustered according to the five primary themes of the study. One, the practitioner's inner work and education. Two, fostering clients' inner resilience. Three, encouraging clients to take action. Four, helping clients find social connection and emotional support by joining groups. And five, connecting clients with nature. The results in the discussion, the fields of psychoanalysis, ecotherapy, and Jungian depth psychology were the most prevalent psychological approaches. These results suggest that treatment for eco-anxiety could embrace a holistic model based on two main facets. One, evenly addressing different elements and layers of the client's inner experience, and secondly, creating connections between client, practitioner, groups, and nature. The study concluded that treatment for eco-anxiety should place the practitioner face-to-face -face with their own social and environmental embeddedness. In other words, we're not separate from nature or from each other, and any treatment or proposed treatment should embrace that idea. Many authors emphasize the need for practitioners to make their practice a space in which eco-anxiety can truly be welcomed and not minimized, or explained away as a distraction from personal themes, or blocked off because of the professional's own anxieties. The review also found a high number of proposed interventions involving groups. To engage with eco-anxiety, it's vital to provide a space for the expression of emotion. One of the reasons that group interventions appear so much in the literature reviewed is because groups can act as powerful emotional containers for the profound existential distress that tends to accompany eco-anxiety.
The articles in the study point to the importance of understanding the specific kinds of grief underlying eco-anxiety. Eco-anxiety is a form of disenfranchised grief, not safe to express. In other words, especially here in American society, there's a lot of denialism concerning global environmental issues like climate change. And it's not safe to express it in public because there might be some social repercussions or even, in some cases, employment or other repercussions. You might be fired for your views or you might be socially ostracized for your views because, unfortunately, we have politicized issues like climate change and environmentalism. Unfortunately, it's not a political issue, so to speak, because conservatives and liberals both need air to breathe. We both need an environment to live in. So, nonetheless, it can be a socially ostracizing issue, and because of this, there's a high degree of disenfranchisement for people who are concerned about the environment. And this is one reason that groups can be so successful in the treatment of eco-anxiety, because it lets people know that they're not alone. Especially like we were talking about earlier, there are a lot of people who publicly, for political reasons, espouse one philosophy regarding environmental issues, and then in private, express anxiety over those same issues. But in a group, they can be with people who express the same eco-anxiety and realize that they're not alone and that they don't have to express one ideal in society because they're afraid of ostracism while holding another one in private. Four authors identified in the review refer to the traumatic component of eco-anxiety. Therapists working with eco-anxiety should therefore be trauma-informed and preferably trauma-trained. Treating eco-anxiety by providing its sufferers with shared emotional space through groups may have a far greater impact than merely helping individuals better tolerate their distress. Groups that provide shared emotional space can be an important part of creating lasting change in a way that goes beyond the scope of mere treatment and shifts their relationship with the world. And in doing so, that's that second-order change that we've talked about several times now, that paradigm shift to a new way of seeing and being in the world. Such groups could act as a bridge between strict behavioral concepts of change and deeper, more holistic, and more emotion-embracing approaches. In conclusion, the review identified a variety of interventions for both individual and group treatment, and these interventions targeted many layers of the individual's well-being, from inner experiences, such as thought processes, to connecting with others through sharing and rituals, and to communing with the natural world. Recommendations for treatment plans are to focus on holistic, multi-pronged, and grief-informed and trauma-informed approaches that include eco-anxiety-focused group work. The next study is Clark, Cotera, and McEwen, 2021, a qualitative study comparing mindfulness and shinrin yoku, forest bathing, from practitioners' perspectives. This particular study compares and contrasts forest, forest bathing and mindfulness. Forest bathing, also known as Shinrin Yoku, has a lot of similarities with mindfulness, but there are some differences as well. And this study examines how forest bathing can enhance mindfulness and vice versa. So what is forest bathing? Forest bathing and forest therapy, also known as Shinrin-yoku, is not just walking in the woods. It means taking in the forest with all of the senses while engaged in the conscious and contemplative practice of being immersed in the sights, sounds, smells, and physical sensations of being in the forest. In other words, it means exploring the forest with all of your senses. 
The line between forest bathing and mindfulness is unclear, as there is a lot of overlap between the practices. This study attempts to clarify the boundaries between the two. Semi-structured interviews were conducted with seven trained and experienced practitioners of both mindfulness and forest bathing. Reflexive thematic analysis revealed four main themes. One, differences between the approaches. Two, the benefits of forest bathing. Three, biophilia through forest bathing. And four, inward versus outward attentional focus as a distinction between the approaches. The study found that both practices increased well-being. Practitioners revealed key barriers to mindfulness. For vulnerable groups experiencing mental health challenges or difficulties achieving a meditative state, mindfulness may introduce well-being risks. And that gets into that inward versus outward focus that we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Forest bathing offers a gentler, more intuitive approach that encourages outward attentional focus. And by doing so, forest bathing overcomes these difficulties. Adaptations to forest bathing are recommended for those expressing fear or discomfort in forests. And we've already talked about that, that if you have difficulty, anxiety about uh, being in the forest, that you're going to have to take special care with those clients and do a little more work with them before taking them into a forest. Conclusions of the study. This study highlights the suitability of mindfulness and forest bathing for those who would benefit from an improvement in well-being. The study concluded that forest bathing may have greater accessibility than mindfulness alone for the reasons stated above. And just to make that a little more clear, the inward versus outward focus. Mindfulness is basically inwardly focused. It teaches you to observe and describe your thoughts and feelings to yourself. Forest bathing is essentially outwardly focused. It's exploring the forest with all of your senses. What do I smell? What do I see? What do I taste? What do I touch? What do I hear? For people who have had traumatic experiences, especially people with disassociative disorders or the tendency towards disassociation, inward focus can be detrimental and in some cases even dangerous because it could put them into a flashback situation. In that case, forest bathing can provide an outwardly focused approach that kind of backs in through the back door into mindfulness. And what I mean by that is that you learn to be mindful by focusing outward instead of focusing inward. And then, and only then, when you develop your mindful skills that way by focusing outward, then you're able to do the inward work. Further adaptations need to be made to mindfulness practice to increase its acceptability for a wide and wider variety of groups. That's one of the other conclusions that the study came to. Vulnerable populations include those who may be at risk of re-traumatization, experiencing extreme mental health challenges, or who experience more difficulty in achieving a mindful state. And we've already talked about that, especially those people who are in danger of disassociation, that an inward focus can be a danger to them. And also people who have various forms of attention deficit, attention deficit disorder, things like autism, spectrum disorders, where it's difficult for them to focus inwardly, then that outward attentional focus might be a help. These individuals would benefit from additional support and consideration of forest bathing as a gentler pathway to well-being gains. Further adaptations to forest bathing are necessary when individuals express biophobia. Biophobia is just the fear of living things or the fear of being outdoors. Fear or discomfort in the forest environment. Session links may need to be reduced for elderly populations, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of movement in the forest. Some elderly people might not be able to have the stamina to spend an hour walking through the forest. Compassion for nature as an outcome of forest bathing may have a role in preserving valuable green spaces. 
And the final study we're going to look at here is the Wellness Society Ecotherapy Workbook. We're going to talk about the tools and techniques in this workbook that you can also use with your clients. This is the Ecotherapy Workbook, and it's published by the Wellness Society. And the website is thewellnesssociety.org. This is a, an agency in the United Kingdom. What it is is a 10-page resource book, and it's not copyrighted, so you can distribute it with your clients. And again, there's the website if you want to download a copy of it. And it contains 20 ecotherapy suggestions. The first suggestion is to go for an awe walk. Visit a local or national park and focus your attention on what you can see, hear, and smell. Practice what's called beginner's mind in Buddhism, seeing things as though you're looking at them for the first time. It's easy to spend most of our lives walking around on autopilot, but making an effort to truly notice the details of what's around you can help spark those feelings of awe. Search for a local forest to walk in. And again, this is a United Kingdom publication, so join Ramblers, which is the UK's largest walking group. Or if you're not in the United Kingdom, you can look for a walking group where you are. Discover a local nature reserve to visit. Find a botanical garden to browse. Or just book a walking holiday. Second suggestion from the workbook is to take an animal for a nature walk. Research shows that spending time with dogs can reduce stress and anxiety, can ease loneliness, and encourage playfulness. If you have a dog, go ahead and take them for a walk. If you don't have a dog, you can offer to walk the dog with someone you know or join the Borrow My Doggy website. Third ecotherapy suggestion is to go camping. Number four is to enjoy a countryside break. Browse Airbnb for a countryside getaway and then go maybe for a weekend or a whole week if you have the time. Hunt for free food. Foraging refers to searching for food in the natural environment. It's also known as hunting and gathering, and it's what our ancestors did for millions of years. Common foraged foods nowadays include wild garlic for homemade pesto, blackberries for delicious desserts, and elderflowers for homemade cordials. I live here in the Pacific Northwest, and we have blackberries growing everywhere. We also have apples all over the place. There are so many apples here, they're just kind of falling off the tree because there's not enough people to eat them all. So if this is the kind of thing that might interest you, you can buy a foraging guide that lets you know locally what foods might be in your area that you could forage for. Number six is to try out nature photography. And if you have no experience with photography, there are YouTube videos now that you can find that will teach you how to do it. Most smartphones have cameras on them now and have fairly good cameras on them. So they make it fairly easy to take good photography pictures in wild environments. So you can try landscape photography or wildlife photography. Number seven, they refer to as spying on birds. In other words, bird watching. Number eight is to start a nature scrapbook. And with your nature scrapbook, you can collect plants and flowers to keep pressed inside of your scrapbook. You can make notes about your awe walks, treating them as a type of journal. Or invest in a good camera and feature your nature photography inside. Or browse Pinterest for more scrapbooking ideas. Number nine is to get creative with arts and crafts. There's plenty of free high quality videos on YouTube teaching you how to draw nature. So take a sketch pad with you to the park. Pinterest is also jam packed with inspiration for nature themed craft act activities for kids. 
for example, you could create your own bird feeder. There are stick crafts that you can do using sticks that you forage in nature. And there's butterfly nature craft, where you build things for the butterflies. And I would also say we talked about the eco art therapy briefly, and we'll be talking about that more when we get to the interventions section. But eco art therapy is something you can also do create objects made with nature, like feathers, leather, sticks, that sort of thing. Or you can make art to be installed in nature, like outdoor sculptures. Number 10, go geocaching. Geocaching is an outdoor treasure hunting game. Your phone's GPS helps you find the treasure. If you've never done it before, geocaches are generally little boxes that are on a pole or somehow attached so that they can't be taken away. And then people leave things in them. Usually, like when I go hiking, a geocache will have things like extra granola bars or water or maps or things that might be useful on the hike, like a compass or flashlight batteries. So what happens is with the geocache is that somebody will drop a pin in a Google map and then you can use your cell phone to go find it. Number 11, join an ecotherapy program. And we've already discussed quite a few ecotherapy programs here. But if you have the availability and the time, you might consider joining one in your region. Adventure therapy involves doing adventurous physical activities in a group, such as rafting, rock climbing, or caving. Animal-assisted interventions involve being in spaces such as farms, where you come into contact with animals and spend time feeding or petting them. Green exercise therapy involves doing exercise in green spaces, for example, walking, running, or cycling. I like to mountain bike myself, and that's one of my favorite activities. Nature arts and crafts includes creating art in green space, using the environment as inspiration, or using natural materials, such as wood, grass, or clay. Number 12, become a volunteer. In a study of volunteers at the Wildlife Trust in the United Kingdom, 95% of the people who were experiencing poor mental well-being at the start of their volunteering project said they felt better in six weeks. So if you can volunteer for some sort of outdoor program, that would be beneficial. And it doesn't have to be an official organized program either. It could be something as simple as asking your neighbor to go for a walk or volunteering to help an elderly neighbor uh, with their yard work or something along those lines. 13 is exercise outdoors, and we've already touched on that to some extent. Cycling, bike, biking in the outdoors, going for walks, swimming, canoeing, whatever sport that's outdoors catches your interest that involves exercise, you can do that. Number 14, attend an outdoor meditation or yoga retreat. And these are getting more and more popular, so they're getting easier and easier to find, especially if you live in an urban or suburban area. Number 15. Enjoy a scenic drive. Studies suggest that mere glimpsing of nature from a window or even photographs can enhance mental well-being. So going for a drive and looking at the scenery can enhance your well-being as well. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to do any physical exertion. One study found that heart surgery patients in intensive care units felt significantly less anxiety after viewing pictures of trees and water. And you may recall that we discussed that study earlier. Another study found that people who have a view of nature from their office space reported higher job and life satisfaction than those who didn't have such a view. Sixteen, watch a nature documentary. And again, it doesn't have to be actual time in nature. Just watching pictures of nature, like a nature documentary or uh, some movie that's based on nature, has similar benefits. Seventeen, go stargazing. Take some blankets to keep warm and marvel at the vast universe we're in. If you have binoculars or a telescope, even better. Now, you might have to do a little traveling to get away from the light pollution, 
But if you're fortunate enough to live in an area where there's not too much light pollution and you can see a lot of stars, then this is a great activity. 18. Visit a park. Head to the park with a book, a bike, or bread for the ducks. And another thing about the park is that it offers some great socialization activities if other people are there at the park with you. 19. Arrange a picnic or a barbecue or a cookout. 20. Do some gardening. And here are some easy to grow foods, strawberries, radishes, chilies, beetroot, and apples. And again, this is based on the United Kingdom, so some other crops might grow more easily in whatever area you live in. Growing herbs like mint, basil, and lavender is also fairly simple. And most of the time you can buy those in the grocery store and then just transplant them. That's it for the Ecotherapy Workbook. Now you might ask why this is included in the research section and not in the interventions section. That's because if you download the book, there are links and citations to most of the studies here to back up all these ecotherapy activities. So if you're looking for data or for studies on ecotherapy, you can download this workbook from the wellnesssociety.org and it'll have all that information in it. And of course, most of those citations are also in the course materials packet that you got when you downloaded this course. That concludes Ecotherapy Research Since 2018, Part 2, for the Ecotherapy and Introduction module.